It's okay.
The Lord be with you. We welcome you to Zion today as we gather for worship. It's always a joy to be with you. Uh, a few announcements before we get going. Actually, lots of things, as always, happening, happening in the life of Zion. Uh, after worship today, if you are able to help put risers up in the front, you, many of you know the routine by now. Just a reminder, if you get to the Advent wreath and think you're going to pick it up and walk off with it, it comes in two pieces. You need two people, all right? So just warning on that one. But otherwise, if you could help move uh, risers for our program practice uh, during Sunday school, but our program, our Christmas program, is this evening. Program starts at 6.30, but we'll have some student musicians begin already at 6 o'clock. We encourage you to come out and join us for that celebration where our children will share the Christmas message with us. So we're excited about that this evening. And then join us afterwards for our birthday party for Jesus, for our fellowship time, and, and just a time to be together. So that's tonight. I invite you to be a part of that. You will also notice in the fellowship hall there are some poinsettias on the tables, and those poinsettias are for some of our homebound members. I think they should have a name next to them. If you see a name of someone you know that you wouldn't mind delivering it to, we would welcome you to do that. That'd be wonderful. And also, you will see in your worship folder uh, just a brief note from Catherine Schneider. She is the DCE to whom we extended a call last Sunday. I had the, I've had a couple conversations with her during the week, and we're trying to work out a time for for her and her husband to come and visit. Uh, one little delay in their visit plans. Her husband is going to be having double hernia surgery here in the next week or so. I said, why don't you just take care of that and then we'll talk about a visit. He may not feel like making the trip from Texas uh, for a couple weeks and that's okay. So we'll, we'll give them time to get through that and then work on a visit here in the next few weeks. We're look, looking forward to that. And okay, we get to actually have of our adult Bible class time today. I'm excited about this. So, you know, we've been having this series on the spiritual realm and the earthly realm and how these two realms overlap. And we've been looking at the way the scriptures describe in this section of our study, the different rebellions in the Genesis narrative. You know Adam and Eve, and maybe you know Babel, but maybe you aren't quite as familiar with Genesis chapter 6 and these strange characters called the Nephilim. Who are they? And uh, how do they play into the Genesis narrative? We'll spend some time today talking about that question. And then uh, next Sunday, well, I should start with next Saturday, this coming Saturday, we have our Christmas Eve services. Now, you have two opportunities at Zion, one over at Trinity. Our opportunities here are at 3 and 7. Both are candlelight services. And Trinity has the 4 o'clock service. On Christmas Day, you have two opportunities, one at Trinity, they're at 9, we're at 10. 10 o'clock in the fellowship hall, that's our brunch and hymn sing. We really invite you to be a part of that. It's a neat family-friendly environment, a great time to be together. Uh, if you're able to bring a dish, wonderful. If not, just bring yourself. We're we'll gl glad to have you. And we'll make sure to get to sing your favorite Christmas hymn, because you get to pick what you want to sing, and that's this coming Sunday. Okay. Uh, that's a, a, a few of those announcements. The rest are in your worship folder. I ask you to take time to do that. Um, if you're reading your bulletin and you say, that doesn't look like Susan Lamb at the, uh, the bench, and you think, who is that stranger back there? Uh, Timothy is home from college, and uh, I had intended to give him the weekend off this weekend because uh, he and his siblings are in the Carol Area Symphony, the All Strings Attached, and their concerts are this weekend, and he's participating in that. Uh, but uh, one of our organists, Susan, as you know, she has MS, and sometimes that just does bad things to your body. And it decided to do that to her this weekend. So uh, she had been gracious, gracious enough to fill in for when we had a sick organist here a couple weeks ago, and now it's our turn to return the favor and fill in. So last night I said to Timothy, um, you're playing tomorrow. Uh, so, so he's ready to go, and we're thrilled to have you back from college, Timothy, to lead us in worship today. Let's turn to our first song.
We stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. I, a poor sinner, confess to you, O Almighty God, my Maker and Redeemer, that I have sinned not only with thoughts, words, and actions, but that I am by nature unclean, conceived and born in sin, and inclined to all evil. I have not earned anything but your wrath, and for this I am sorry with all my heart that I have provoked you, O God, my Lord. But I have access to your steadfast love, O God, my Heavenly Father. I seek and desire your grace for the sake of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, be merciful to me, a poor sinner. Forgive my sins and give me your Holy Spirit, that I may obey your divine will, and in my station in life produce much fruit to your glory. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. O oh, Father in heaven, O oh, maker of heaven and earth, you who created us and all creatures, giving us bodies and souls, who still preserve us and all the living, who provides for all our needs of this body and life, who guards and protects us from all evil, have mercy upon us. O oh, Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, O Son of Man, born of the Virgin Mary, you who have redeemed us in your humiliation, being born under the law, by living the perfect life we have not, by sacrificing your life to pay for the sins of our lives, you who have freed us in your exaltation to be your own, our lives hidden in your life, to live under you in your kingdom, to rise on the last day as you rose on the third day, to live in eternal joy with you and the Father and the Holy Spirit, have mercy upon us. O Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father, O Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Son, O Paraclete, O Comforter and Friend, who instills first life into all within the mother's womb and gives first breath at birth, who gives all who believe new life in Christ, who gathers by the gospel all the church, who in the church forgives all, even the penitent, who has taken or hurt life, who will raise all the dead and give eternal life to all believers in Christ, have mercy upon us. You may be seated. Our next hymn is actually going to follow the tune that's, I had originally changed the tune. So when it says tune 344, it's not. It's tune 355. I only mention that because it may be a hymn with which you're not immediately familiar so if you read notes and you want to grab your hymnal, just be aware that you can check the words as you go along with one, two, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so that means we're not singing all the verses. Sometimes people say to me, Pastor always makes us sing all the verses. No, I don't. <laughs> you just don't know it because it's on the screen. So 
We are singing in several verses, but um, if you sing notes, I encourage you to take your hymnal out to 355. Uh, this then base, is based off that uh, intro it, uh, from Psalm 130 and, and Isaiah 64, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. This is the prayer of Advent. This is the prayer of the church, that you would come. And you will see that reflected in the hymn. So 355, O oh, Savior, rend the heavens wide. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come and help us by your might, that the sins which weigh us down may be quickly lifted by your grace and mercy. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, on last Wednesday, we made reference to this verse, and this is a biblical prophecy, and you're going to recognize it as the virgin will be with child, right? And we'll hear that in our gospel text where Matthew will reach back and claim this verse uh, for Jesus, that Jesus fulfills it. But as we read this uh, in context, I mean, we're not reading the whole section, but just a snippet of it, you're going to be astute enough to realize there's more going on in this text than just a simple 
prophecy of Jesus being born of a virgin and then Jesus being born of a virgin. There's something going on in Isaiah's time. And if you remember from last week when I had with the children up front and on the screen, uh, we might call this what we call a fullest sense prophecy, where there was an initial fulfillment in the time of Isaiah. Uh, and you see the initial fulfillment is that this child is born, and before the child is very old, the, the two uh, threatening nations to the north of Israel, they're going to be laid waste, and that threat is going to be put to bed. Although, uh, what will come after them will be Assyria, and that will be a form of judgment coming upon Israel. Nonetheless, in Isaiah's time, there's this initial fulfillment. And what Matthew is saying, though, is when Jesus comes on the scene, he provides the fullest sense of this prophecy, this child uh, born of the virgin, and he is the evidence that God indeed is with us in the flesh. So we might call this, again, a fullest sense prophecy. We begin with verse number 10 of chapter 7. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be a deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. And I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Here then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second text is from the book of Romans. We begin the, the book here, verses 1 through 7. Uh, you're going to like this. These seven verses, they're one sentence. So Paul just loved these incredibly complex sentences. So uh, if you don't hear me take a breath, it's because there's no place to take a breath in uh, this incredibly long sentence. But beginning with verse number 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand and we say together, Alleluia. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. We begin with verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I forgot to put this in the bulletin, but children, come on up and find a seat, and we'll spend a few minutes talking about our Christmas on our Christmas tree. So come on up here and find a seat this way and face the Christmas tree. Okay, as you're coming up, and before I ask for a couple of volunteers to pick out Christmas, I want you again to hear I'm not using the word ornament. It's fine if we use the word ornament, but these are not what we would call ornaments. They are chrismons. Now, you think, well, what does that word mean, Pastor? Well, there are two words in the word chrismon. They're squished together. One is Christ, and you know that word, and the other it is monogram. And you say, well, what does that mean? Monogram thinks symbol or picture. So Christ pictures or Christ symbols. All of these in some way teach us something about Jesus. Now, the two things I'll point out first, then you get, then you get to pick one off of here. Most of them are gold and white, and those two colors are important. The gold will tell us that Jesus is king, all right? In fact, you can see up there the crown. That's the reminder that Jesus is king, and the gold is the kingly color. The white would be a color of purity, that Jesus is a pure or sinless king. So those two are predominantly the colors that you see on the tree. Okay, now... Robbie, I see you're ready to go. Come pick out one. Okay, the star at the way top, which I cannot get down, but I will point to. The star can have a couple different uh, Christmas connections. Now, I'm going to blow your brain just for a minute. You often have our nativity scenes with the stars in them. Okay, get ready. The star wasn't there at the birth of Jesus. What? Just, just read your Bible, you'll see. Uh, it was there when the Magi came. And they come after the birth of Jesus. Now, in our nativity scenes, we often squish these things together. And that's okay. But in the text, they're separated. But Jesus is actually referred to in Scripture as the bright and morning star. He is uh, the star. Of, like in the morning, this bright morning star, it's the brightest. And it's a symbol of hope. Okay? So Jesus is this living symbol of hope for us of eternal life. Good. Yeah, Brogan, pick one up for me. You, you, you can come up here and point for me. I'm not going to have a point to one. Oh, good choice. Okay, you know what? This is really interesting. You see this and you say, I, looks like an H and a C. And you say, can't they spell? What is I-H-C? Now, if you were reading those in English, that's what they would say. But those are not English letters. These are Greek letters. And if I were to translate this into English for us, this would be the equivalent of our J. This would basically be the equivalent of our E. And this would be the equivalent of our S, J-E-S. And it's the first three letters of somebody's name. You got it. Jesus. Jesus in Greek. Jesus in English. And these are the first three letters of Jesus' name. And notice what's around Jesus. A circle. A circle is a symbol of eternal life. Right? It goes on without end. And Jesus gives us life. Adam, which one do you want to do? Uh, oh, the, uh, the rose with the star. Up, way, up there, right? Okay, so the star image, image, I've already talked about the star. So in the book of Isaiah, there's this prophecy, and we actually read it here a couple weeks ago, where the, the root or the stump of Jesse, will spring forth with this shoot, with this new life. Now, you say, but that doesn't say anything about a rose. No. In um, historic Christian poetry, a rose was often used to symbolize this, this blooming of new life out of this stump. And the stump, remember, was that Israel was going to be cut down by Assyria and Babylon. But God was going to raise up this righteous king, this, this um, shoot, or in this case, this beautiful rose. 
and he was going to be this righteous king who would rule. So, any guesses who that righteous shoot or bloom would be? Who do you think that is? You got it. It's Jesus. So that is a symbol. And um, we have a hymn in our hymnal, Lo, how a rose air blooming. It's poetically tied into the Isaiah text. And the blooming rose is Jesus. Kind of a neat word picture to think about. Ember, do you have one? You want to you walk up and point to it? You can come up to the tree and point to it for me. Which one, which one do you want? Which one do you want? You want to point for me? It's a big tree. You're almost there. The suspense is building. Okay, we got it. Good. Okay, good selection. Let's see if I can get this one off and show it to you. Okay, so what we have here actually is, now watch, okay. If you were to take this one and follow it, and now you have to do the imaginary all the way back around, and you'd go there. And then if you take this one and you go all the way around, and you go back to there. And if you take this one and you go all the way around, and you go back to there. How many circles have I done so far? Three. And all of them are inter. Um, interlacing, interconnecting, and they kind of form a triangle here, and there's this circle in the middle connecting them. So, so I've got three, but I've got one. I have one, but I have three. Anything coming to mind? Any, any, anything? What do you got, Luke? Yeah, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this is a pretty traditional Christian symbol for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three, one. Three persons, one God. So circles and triangles inter intersecting, uh, this would be a symbol for Trinity. Okay, now, <coughs> I am going to beg the patience of the congregation and do one more. Okay, who hasn't had a turn? Hasn't had a turn? We'll come pick one. Which one do you want? Okay, excellent. Let's see if I can pull this one off here. Okay, so let's just do the, the symbols on the end. This is interesting. Um, so that looks like what letter? An A. And that would be pretty much equivalent in English. It, it's a Greek letter. It's alpha, and, but A. By the way, you ever heard the word alphabet before? Yeah, I'm sure you have. Alphabet comes from the Greek letters alpha, beta, A, B. So... We know our ABCs, our alphabet, we're actually using a Greek word to refer to the English letters. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, so alpha is an A, and over here, you say, that looks kind of like a horseshoe, but that doesn't make any sense to me. This would be their omega. This is their last letter, which would be like our Z. Now, they're different letters altogether, but for our purposes, the A to Z, what we call the beginning and the end. And who do you think the Bible describes as the beginning and the end? Jesus, right. Jesus is described as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so here we have a little chrismon reminding us that Jesus is the beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega. And if you are ever on that side of our altar, there is an Alpha or, it's an alpha or Omega. I got to look. Watch out. I'm not, I got to find out. Oh, that's, it's both of them. That's right. If you're ever on that side, there's an alpha and omega. So next time, congregation, you're up here having communion, and you wonder what that symbol is, that symbol is the alpha omega. The beginning and the end is Jesus. Symbols are everywhere for Jesus. Thank you for being such good listeners. You can head back to your seats, and we'll sing our next hymn. Is, is the next one um, the angel Gabriel? Is that right? Okay, so this one tells the story, as Luke narrates it, of so we read from Matthew, but Luke narrates the, the angel Gabriel coming to Mary to tell her she's going to have the baby Jesus. And this one traces that story.
Grace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God speaks to us today in our gospel reading from Matthew chapter 1. You can see the title on the screen, The Good News of Jesus' Genesis. There's a lot baked into that title that we're going to take the next several minutes to appreciate. Let's start with Genesis because, well, that's where Matthew starts. The text literally reads, Now the genesis of Jesus Christ thusly was or happened. So Matthew is setting out here in the early verses of his gospel to narrate the genesis of Jesus. In fact, he made his intentions clear with the very first words of his gospel, which literally read, The book of the genesis of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now the word gets translated as genealogy and birth, but it's the same Greek word, and it basically means this is how Jesus got on the scene. Matthew's basic point for our section of text is that Jesus coming on the scene is good news. And we're going to get to that good news in just a few minutes. First, though, we need to start with a few observations. We need to start by dispelling a silly notion that you hear people echo from time to time. It goes something like this. Ancient people, they were largely ignorant of how reality worked. I mean, they didn't have all the scientific knowledge that we have, so they were more apt to attribute things they couldn't understand to, to miracles. So, I mean, that's why it's not surprising that people said that Mary was a virgin mother. We are smarter now, so we know that's not possible. Now, to put this kindly, that notion is just plain silly. It's just silly. It's patently false for so many reasons. One, ancient people knew where babies came from. Joseph knew where babies came from. The one Mary was pregnant with didn't come from him, and his first thought wasn't, oh, there must be some spiritual being involved here. No, his first thought was, Mary's been unfaithful. It took an angel of God disturbing Joseph at night to convince him otherwise. Now, two, I want to address the notion that ancient people were ignorant. Now, <coughs> excuse me, it's true that the ancients lacked the microscope and the telescope, satellites and cell phones, but it's patronizing and insulting to suggest they were ignorant. I mean, these are the people who built things like the pyramids in Egypt. They built the temple in Jerusalem with its massive cut stones for its mount. They built the over 100-foot-tall statue of Colossus at Rhodes, the aqueducts throughout the Roman Empire, paved roads that still are there today. Elaborate shipping routes, seafaring vessels that they navigated by the stars, irrigation systems, and so, so much more. And they did it all without so much as a calculator. The ancients were not ignorant people. Now it's true, they may have had a different conceptualization of the world than we do. So in general, they conceptualized the spiritual realm to be much closer to the physical realm than we do. In fact, they saw them overlapping and interacting in key ways and places. And we may be tempted to scoff at this as if, as if they were just some, as this sort of ignorant and silly but that may turn out to be a premature judgment because when the full truth is revealed, it may turn out that we have been the ignorant, silly ones. Now, our world has largely separated the spiritual and the physical. We treat them almost like they're two separate, non-overlapping worlds, and we tend to treat them differently. We tend to act like the, the physical world is the real world. And the spiritual world, that's the escape world. And people who need religion can have their spiritual world they escape to on the weekend, 
But it really has nothing to do with the real world. So our culture is seeing a rise of the nuns, people who claim no religious affiliation, right? So none, N-O-N-E. But this is actually uh, misleading. It would be more accurate to call this growing group the none of the above, because while they have largely evicted God from their world, so they don't identify with what we see as a traditional religion, they actually have not evicted religion, nor can they, because man at heart is a religious being. Man at heart is a religious being. And that's actually a really important claim I'm making here. I don't have time to explain it like I would like to, but I'm saying that man's deepest needs are religious needs. Okay, the book of Ecclesiastes talks about God putting eternity into man's heart. St. Augustine formerly, uh, famously talked about our restless hearts, right, being restless until they found their rest in God. This would take me way too long to unpack. But if you look into the things people are embracing today, all right, things like identity politics, social justice, sexual ideology, critical theory, okay, if you look into these things, there are religious concepts driving every one of them. Concepts of justice, concepts of guilt, of innocence, of goodness, and so many more. But they lack God. So they have evicted the Creator God from their lives, but they really can't live without the concepts that emerge from God's realm, the spiritual realm. So they steal them and import them without God and without their spiritual backdrop. Of course, without this backdrop, they really don't make sense. They're like a house with no foundation, just trying to float on thin air. They don't have their authority or their objectivity. And instead of being good and beautiful concepts that enable human flourishing, they have become weapons in the hands of godless men. So we are watching in real time the effects of this great forgetting unfolding in front of us. Now, I'm not a prophet, but if early results tell us anything, they tell us that there are going to be a lot of hurting, broken, confused, and disillusioned people who in the core of their being are hungry for the gospel that we are preserving in Christ's church. So we need to be ready to share. Now, our point for now is that we should not write off the ancients as ignorant. We have a lot to learn from them, specifically how to see the world, how to see it as a, the stage where the physical realm and the spiritual realm are actually interacting and how and where they overlap, how, and how their future overlapping is our great hope. So in our text, they overlap in an amazing way, and I want to get to that. But first, I want to pause just for a moment. I want to appreciate something that Matthew says about Joseph. Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant. He knew he wasn't the father. But Matthew tells us that Joseph was a man of honor, a just man. So he did not want to put Mary to shame. Now, I want to stop here. And then I want you to see this, okay? There's wisdom here. There, there is deep wisdom here. Men of honor don't bring shame on others, even if they deserve it. They don't use their position of power or authority, and Joseph had a position of power and authority in this relationship. He could have put Mary to public shame. But men of honor don't use their position of power or authority to bring shame on others. They don't use their power to tear people down. 
when men do this, they are not acting as men of honor, but as tyrants and fools. Men, we have a lot to learn from Joseph on how to be men of honor. But, okay, we need to get to the angel's words. The angel comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is really great stuff. So Joseph is to name the child Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Okay, so the name is actually connected to the saving. Now track with me now. The name Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. It means Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. So Jesus' name contains his mission. He will save his people from their sins. Now, this may not initially ring with the gospel hope that it should because like I mentioned earlier, we have largely separated the spiritual realm from the physical realm. And we don't typically see how the spiritual realm has answers for the physical realm. How anything it has to say can affect the physical realm. How the announcement of a Savior from sin is truly good news for us in the physical realm. Okay, so we, we, we tend <laughs> to confine sin to individual interactions. And it certainly is active there, but it is also running loose in systems and structures in our culture too. So in our culture, we are tied in knots over things like climate policies, ESG investing strategies, cryptocurrency exchange implosions, political polarization, marriage redefinition legislation, gender ideology, free speech arguments, nuclear weapon threats, international relations with China and Russia and Iran, and on and on and on. And these are very important issues. Now, here's what happens. We treat these like they're in the real world. Okay, they're the real world stuff. And we have no idea how anything we do here in church has anything to say to these issues. Okay, because we're treating the, it's like, well, here's the spiritual realm, here's the physical real realm, but they don't really talk to each other. Okay, but look at the words that are being used in these conversations when people talk about these things. Listen to the words. They use words like justice, equity, oppression, marginalization, fraud, deceit, right, wrong. Listen to those words. Do you think Scripture has anything to say about these things? Do you think God has any thoughts on these things? Yes! But God and His Word are forgotten, actually intentionally forgotten in our culture. They're supposed to live in that little religion box over here on Sundays because the spiritual world and then the physical real realm, they're not supposed to overlap. This is the great modern sin the intentional forgetting of God. The belief that God and the spiritual realm have nothing to say, nothing to teach us, no connection at all to the issues that plague us today. Now, we criticize the ancients for seeing God or gods everywhere, for seeing a spiritual dimension in play in the events unfolding in their world, for seeing spiritual powers influencing the actions of rulers and authorities. We see that and we condescendingly scoff. But we have swung the pendulum to the opposite extreme, to the point where we can see God nowhere. To the point where we don't even believe spiritual forces are in play at all. Now, I'm not suggesting the ancients got it all right. But I think we are arrogant fools if we think our intentional forgetting of God is wise. And into our world, the angel says, Jesus will save his people from their sins. And the first step is inserting himself 
into the physical world, inserting himself physically into our world. The first step is powerfully connecting the spiritual and physical realms in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you see that in our text? The spiritual realm is entering the physical. God has something to say to our world. And then Matthew, like I mentioned earlier, he reaches back into the Old Testament and says, do you remember that prophecy of Isaiah about Emmanuel, about God being with us, about the spiritual realm entering the physical realm in powerful, in a powerful and a meaningful way? Remember that? He says, he says, that prophecy stands fulfilled in Jesus. It's like Matthew is saying, God will not be forgotten. He is relevant to what we are doing. He insists that he belongs in the conversation. And indeed, as we read on, we see he's actually on a rescue mission to redeem the world, to set the world to rights, not just to forgive the world of its sin of its sinful forgetting of God, but to save it from its headlong charge toward mayhem and self-destruction. This is why the announcement that God is with us is such good news. God has interjected himself into our life to save us, to rescue us, to call us out of and away from the dead-end road of destruction we've been barreling down the godless way we've been processing the world and to teach us to see the spiritual reality of his kingdom advancing in our world. The spiritual reality of his kingdom driving out the spiritual forces of evil and darkness. The spiritual reality of his kingdom actively working in our world. That's why the Christian gospel is so important. It is not a message that says, hey, join us for a little getaway every weekend here over at church, right? Just come over here and, <coughs> excuse me, get your religious fix for an hour. It is not a getaway. It is a get involved. It's the bold declaration that God in Jesus has gotten involved. The spiritual realm is coming among the physical earthly realm. Heaven is entering earth. Heaven is rescuing earth. Heaven is recreating earth. That's the Christian gospel. I mean, that, that's what we're doing here. That's what you are a part of. That's what your children and grandchildren are a part of. I mean, that's what Sunday school is about. That's what confirmation is about. That's what youth group is about. That's what Bible study is about. That's why we volunteer. That's why we give. That's why we're expanding Zion's ministry. There is no way we can hear the angel's words to Joseph and come away with any sort of silo theology where we just escape from the barren, cold, and desolate world once a week to our happy, warm, and bright spiritual world on Sunday. No. No. The angel's announcement to Joseph means that we have a dynamic theology bent on engaging the world with the reign of God in Jesus Christ, bent on bringing the spiritual world into the physical. These two realms are meant to be together. Heaven and earth are meant to be together. And the gospel news that Joseph heard is that that's what God is up to in Jesus. God is with us. He has come to save us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to stand. And with joy and boldness we confess together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May be seated as we gather our offering, and kids, you can bring yours forward too. We stand to pray. In our prayers this morning, we will be including two grieving families. On Tuesday, we will have Christian burial for Virginia Kroger, and on Wednesday, Christian burial for Cheryl Burr. So Tuesday at 10.30, Wednesday at 1.30. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for the gospel that we are privileged to celebrate in this place. But it is not a gospel that lives only within these walls. It is a gospel that enters into our world. 
a gospel that promises to save our world. Help us not to participate in the modern forgetting of God but to see how you are active in our world, working to redeem it. Help us bring to bear the words of the faith, that we would define them as you define them, words like justice and equity and righteousness, words like good and right and true and beautiful. Teach us how to bring these words to bear in our conversations beyond these walls, that your kingdom may be extended In your name, receive the glory, do it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for those in need of your care, especially we name Lyle Munt, Pastor Johnson, Paxton Burrell, Stan Bach, Tanya Jacobson, Rhonda Sandinson, John Bexton, Rhonda Moore, Jasper Foley, Jim Devers, Rick Spock, Justine Schwizo, Nancy Grimm, Sherry Steffes. We commend them and all for whom we name in our hearts into your hands, asking for your grace and the healing that you have in store for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who have fresh grief and those who have grief that is prolonged, for those who grieve the death of those they love and who are awaiting from the Lord reunion and restoration, we pray that you would grant your grace. Today, we especially name the family of Cheryl Burr and the family of Virginia Kroger. Grant them your peace and hope in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our missionaries, Pastor Oliver, Pastor Lopez, Pastor Ferry, Mark and Megan Monti, for Terza, for cross-cultural worker Molly, Continue to work through them where you call them. Give them boldness and joy to confess Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For law enforcement at military men and women, Scott Stribe, Stephen Grimm, Aaron Stokel, Lillian Ginzen, Tanner Crawford. Protect them from harm, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the people of Ukraine, for the church in Ukraine, we pray for peace, opening of doors of the gospel, restoration of livelihoods, and for justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for our partnership with Trinity in Manila and for our preschool, that Christ's name may be known and confessed in these places among these people, and that you would bless the decision of our called DCE. And according to your will, you would bless and strengthen the ministry and mission in this place that your gospel may be heard and confessed with joy and boldness among us and the people that you have brought into our lives. And we ask that you would hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Maybe seated. Just a couple other quick things. Um, Risers, if you can help with risers when we're done here, that'd be wonderful. If you can take poinsettias, that would be wonderful. If you are someone who has joined Zion in the last year, we have a small gift for you on the green tablecloth table out on the fellowship hall. We ask you to pick one of those up and take that home and enjoy that. And on our last hymn, I simply want to point out, we're singing four of its verses. That's not all of them. (laughs) All right, so you don't get to see that on the screen, but uh, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, we have the four verses we'll sing. <laughs>